Well, obviously, uh, you're hearing a lot of messages and, and words about the coronavirus. You still turn on the news and you hear that. And there's, you know, just week after week and day after day and hour after hour of negative news. And I've dealt with a couple of messages related to that. But I feel the need, based on the time of season in which we are, find ourselves in, is to go on and move forward to next week's Palm Sunday. And the week after that is is Easter, and so I want to focus, begin focusing on those things. I want to deal with uh, a, a series called Jesus the King, uh, out of Matthew 27 and 28. So in just a moment, I'll read Matthew 27 verses 11 through 31 together, and and we're reminded as we think about this, Jesus the King. In this sense, we get a chance to witness him suffer for you, because we're going to see Jesus' trial. We're going to see what he goes through, in or before he's crucified because of his passion, because of his great love for us and the fact that he cares for us so much. And you know, in, in many ways, our world has been turned upside down. Not, not just our individual worlds, but the entire world has been turned upside down these last couple of weeks with coronavirus. And it's gonna continue for the next few weeks. Um, but in that turning upside down of our world, you, you go back and place yourself in the first century, place yourself in the shoes of the disciples. And here's this one they've been following for a few years. And now he is suffering. I mean, he's just entered on, on Palm Sunday. Hosanna, the praises that were being sung to him. And yet now he's on trial and he's about to be crucified. And the disciples who had their hope in this Messiah that would restore uh, the kingdom to Israel and overthrow Roman rule is now, is now being tried and about to be crucified. Their world's turned upside down. So just like our world's been turned upside down and we've seen changes in the stock market, we've seen changes maybe in your job, maybe you're working from home, maybe you've lost hours, maybe unfortunately you've lost a job. Uh, there's changes to school, the way we do, do, do school now with kids learning at home and trying to learn online. Uh, it just all kinds of different changes. Businesses closed or hours changed, or restaurants only doing takeout and delivery. Big changes, world changes, and yet disciples went through a lot of change. And yet that never stopped Jesus. He foresaw this. He was the one who was uh, in charge. He's the one who's sovereign. And so we know that he can be trusted. And we can trust him and we can emphasize the fact that Scripture teaches that Jesus indeed is the king. So let's look together in Matthew 27, beginning in verse 11. And we're going to read through verse 31. God's word says this. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now the feast the governor was accustomed to release to the, or for the crowd, any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. You know, uh, 
as Matthew writes his gospel, he writes as one who had been a tax collector working for Rome. One who was no longer uh, working for Rome once he followed Jesus. And after following Jesus and seeing Jesus give his life and die on the cross, he then turns around and gives uh, his life to him and serves him. And later in his life, toward the end of his life, probably in the mid-60s, uh, he writes his gospel accounts. He writes primarily uh, to Jewish people to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, the Christ. He, he, he proves and writes to show that the Old Testament scriptures, what we call the Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, were fulfilled in this Jesus. And so he writes in such a way that even Jesus' suffering was important in, uh, in regards to fulfilling scripture. And let me just walk through the narrative with you, uh, what we just read here together. And then let me share with you a couple of uh, takeaways, things we ought to make much of whenever we think about what Jesus has done for us. So when we look at the four Gospels together, we see there were six, actually six different episodes to the trial of Jesus. Uh, we see him appear before Annas and then Caiaphas. Annas was the father-in-law. Caiaphas was the high priest. He went to Annas first and then Caiaphas and then the Jewish Sanhedrin. And so the first three he goes to out of the six episodes, the first three are before the religious Jewish court. And they try him and they find him guilty even though they can't agree on a particular charge. And then he goes to Pilate. Pilate's the Roman governor. He was the one who had the greatest authority there in Jerusalem. And when Pilate finds out after questioning him, because Pilate really doesn't want anything to do with him, he finds him to be innocent. Pilate finds out he's from Galilee, and so he sends him to Herod Antipas, who has charge over Galilee to the north, and Herod's visiting Jerusalem at that time. And he won't talk to Herod at all, so he comes back to Pilate. So there's actually six different episodes. The first three to the Jewish religious court, the last three to the Roman court. And, and, and we see Pilate constantly wanting to, to step away and, and, and not have anything to do with him. But he but begins by asking him, are you, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, as he does three different times in this ongoing account from chapter 26 and 27, you have said so. Now, in the way it's written in the original language, that means that Jesus is affirming this statement. He's not denying it. But he's placed the responsibility upon Pilate. Pilate you know who I am. I'm, I'm agreeing to this. You know who I am, but what are you going to do about it? And really, that's a question that we all have to deal with. Is what are we going to do with this Jesus who is called the Messiah, the King of the Jews? Are we going to do anything with him? Are we just going to disregard him? Are we going to just set him aside as another great religious teacher through times past? Are we going to even question whether or not he existed? Or are we going to deal with him as the King? And so Pilate has to come to reckoning with that, and Pilate doesn't personalize that himself. He just wants to wash his hands of it. He wants to just move along and, and push him aside. And, and while he's wondering why he should even, why he should have Jesus condemned, but his, his wife sends him a message. And she says she's had a dream and this, this Jesus is a righteous man. There's nothing found in him that's worthy of him bearing any kind of guilt. And so Pilate hears what his wife says, but he's also got his own background to deal with. I mean, Pilate was known as a cruel man. He was known as a person who was hard on individuals. He was hard, especially on the Jewish people. I mean, time and again, whether it's Josephus or Philo, which are Jewish historians, or even the Gospels themselves, time and again we see Pilate very, being very harsh on the Jewish people. We know one time he called his army from Caesarea by the sea on the Mediterranean, called them to Jerusalem, and, and with them they carried this uh, image of Caesar. And of course this incited the Jewish people who did not believe in graven images. And, and, and they're willing to riot. And, and, and Pilate actually calls them in together to a theater and then holds a, a sword to their neck, has the soldiers hold a sword and, and threatens to kill them if they continue on. Some of them were willing to die, but Pilate backed off at that time. Well, we know also that uh, Pilate on another occasion uh, had his army carry inscriptions that would incite the Jews and, and, and caused a riot. So much so that it was reported that Emperor Tiberius actually uh, questioned why Pilate would do such a thing. Like, why would you, why would you start a riot unnecessarily? Uh, another time, Pilate found out about a group of Samaritans, half Jew and half Gentile, just to the north of Judea. And they were worshiping on Mount Gerizim, and he sent his soldiers in to capture them and to break up their religious gathering. We also see in Scripture with uh, him killing the Galileans. Galileans were in Jerusalem to offer sacrifices, 
And he sent soldiers in there to kill them, to mix their blood with the blood of the sacrifices, which was a profane thing in Jewish eyes. And, and again, inciting the Jewish people. Time and again, these uh, these took place. He he went into the treasury one time and stole the, the money from the treasury, the Corban, that was supposed to be used for the temple, and he used it to build 50 miles of aqueduct. So, so, so we see Pilate is, is a ruthless man in the Jewish uh, life, but yet he's been reported so many times that Tiberius has had enough. And he's not willing to put up with Pilate's shenanigans any longer. And so one of the reasons why we see Pilate not as harsh on Jesus and wanting to back off is he's afraid what might happen. But because there appears to be possibly a riot about to start, he also doesn't want that. So he winds, it, winds up giving in to the crowd's commands as a command for this, this one to be released. Uh, a custom that Pilate apparently started a few years earlier over Passover was to release a prisoner. Uh, just to give someone freedom during this time. And you couldn't have find a worse criminal in Jewish society at that time, this Barabbas character. But Barabbas was known as an insurrectionist. Some, some gospels call him a robber. A one who was a murderer, Scripture tells us. He's one who tried to start a riot, probably a, a pretend messiah. Probably one that's thinking, hey, if enough of you get with me, we can overthrow Rome. And, and, he, and he failed, and he failed miserably, and he was in prison, and he was about to die for it. He, he was going to go to the cross for his crimes. Probably the two thieves that died with Jesus were probably associates of Barabbas. They were going to be shown to the passersby that anyone that dares rise up against Rome would be treated this way. And so, so Pilate's thinking, I, I can throw the worst criminal out there and then compare him with this Jesus. Jesus that we find innocent, and, and sure the crowd will understand, and, and they'll want Jesus' freedom and not Barabbas, but no, they, they cry out, we, we don't want Jesus, we, we want Barabbas. And so Jesus is offered up in his place, and he asks, well, well what should I do? No evil's been found in this one, but they, they keep crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Time and again, Pilate tried to clear Jesus. He, he tries to pass him off to Herod. He suggested his release according to the custom. He washes his hands of him. He, he, he tries to appeal to them and tries to get them to send him away. He tries to just scourge him lightly and then send him away. But time and again, that's not enough. The Jewish leaders even cry out and they say, well, well our law doesn't allow us to, to put him to death. Well, that's, that's a lie because a few chapters later in the scriptures, we find in Acts chapter 7 that they stoned Stephen when they questioned Stephen's uh, faithfulness and think that he has been charged with some sort of heresy for pretending that Jesus is alive and risen from the dead and is the one to judge them in the days to come. And so they kill him off. They plot to kill Paul in Acts 22 and 23. So they're ready to put some people to death. But why is it they're not willing to put Jesus to death? Because they, they don't want to be responsible. They want to place responsibility on Rome. And they don't want to do it themselves. They want to incite the Jewish crowd, the mob, to rise up against him. That mob that is so fickle. I mean, one moment they're praising him. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then five days later, they're shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Because, because they've turned against him. He's not the kind of Messiah they're expecting. They're wanting one that would rise up and overthrow Rome. And so in crying out, he's, Pilate said, I'm going to wash my hands. They said, well, let his blood be on us and on our children. I mean, they're saying not just on us, but even on our descendants, may his blood be carried out. That is this responsibility. So why did Pilate give in to their cry? Because he was afraid he might lose his position. He would lose his position just a few years later. But he's afraid at this time he's going to lose his position. So he gives in and he, and he hands him over. He wasn't going to let another revolt take place on his watch. It's like uh, John Broadus said. He said, like many a politician, his record was in the way of his conscience. His record was known. Even though he wanted to send Jesus, he, he knew he had sent many others to their deaths. What would be one more? And so before Jesus crucified, they had him scourged, the scripture says there, as he releases him, he delivers, having scourged Jesus, verse 26, he delivered him to be crucified. And then it tells us here in verse 27 and following about the soldiers taking Jesus to the governor's headquarters before the whole battalion. Now elsewhere that's called a cohort. A cohort is one-tenth of a legion. 
Scholars say one-tenth of a legion would have been anywhere from 300 to 600 soldiers. So Jesus is now before 300 to 600 soldiers, and, and they're mocking him as a, as a, as a king. And, and notice what they do here. They, they strip him, and they put a scarlet robe on him. Some translations, scarlet, some say purple. That would be a similar color, similar hue. They twist together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head, and they put a reed in his right hand, and they mock him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, why, why are they saying this? They're saying this because they had this game then, and it, it was called, and we find this in, in other references in ancient uh, literature, but a, bas, a Basalinda game. It's also known as the King's game. And what they would do is they would take a prisoner, a criminal, the, the soldiers would, just kind of to pass the time, and they would dress him up like a king. And then they would put a reed in his hand, and, and maybe maybe a crown or something, but they dress him up, and they would make him go from spot to spot on the on the floor. And at each spot, it would either get verbal abuse or physical abuse. And so they played games with Jesus. Played games with Jesus as king, making fun of him as they continued to beat him. And just as Roman emperors wore a wreath-like crown, they gave him a crown, but it was a crown of thorns placed it on his head. They struck him there. They stripped him of the robe. They put his own clothes back on him, and then they led him away to crucify him. So those are that's a harsh treatment of Jesus. Jesus suffered, and yet he's the king, and yet he suffered, and he suffered for our sins, for your sins and for mine. So what is it that I want us to see based on this narrative? Just a couple of takeaways, a couple of things to make much of in light of these days as we spread the message of hope that we have together in Jesus. And so the first thing I think we ought to do is to make much of the kingship of Jesus. Four times in this passage that I read to you, we see the kingship of Jesus stressed. Make much of the kingship of Jesus. We see it in verse 11. King of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asks. We see it over in verse 29 when they mocked him saying, Hail, king of the Jews. Twice they call him king of the Jews in this passage. But twice he's also called Christ in this passage. It's down in verse 17. Pilate asked, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas, or Jesus who is called Christ? Verse 22. Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Christ is the son of David. Now, he's called Christ earlier in chapter 26 when he stands before Caiaphas and the Jewish Sanhedrin. Tell us, I adjure you by the living God. Verse 63. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. So there he's called Christ. Uh, later on, he's called in just the very next passage. He's called the king of the Jews and the king of Israel. Verse 37, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, the sign says. A little later on in verse 42, as they Jewish uh, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mock him, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down. So time and again throughout this passage and just these words I've shared with you, the emphasis on him being the king. Are you the king of the Jews? What, are, what am I to do with you, you, you Christ, you Messiah? Time and again, he's called the king. And just by the fact that the Roman soldiers mock him doesn't take away from him being king. You know, there's many people today that, that mock our president. And they'll say things about him. And they'll deride him. But that doesn't stop him from being our president. He's still our president. And just because someone mocks Jesus as king doesn't mean he's not really king. He's still king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's the one who's on his throne and he's still sovereign. And so we ought to make much of the kingship of Jesus. A second area in which we witness or which we see here in this text that we ought to make much of is to make much of the crucifixion of Jesus the king. We make much of the kingship of Jesus and we make much of the crucifixion of Jesus as king. And four times here in this passage we see crucifixion. And he's not even been crucified yet. He's not crucified until verses 32 and following. But here the emphasis is, is going to be on his crucifixion. The Gospels is so great it's foreshadowing it time and again. We hear this cry for crucifixion. Verses 22 and 23. What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked, they said, let him be crucified. Why? What evil has he done, Pilate says, but they shot all the more. Let him be crucified. 
It says down in verse 26, Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And then verse 31, after they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him, they led him away to crucify him. Four times he's referenced as king. Four times he's referenced as the crucifixion. All the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, show us that Jesus, Jesus is to be crucified and is crucified. They, they underscore that. And they do that because that's the heart of their message and it's the heart of the Gospel message is the crucifixion of Jesus, that he died for our sins. And we think about him dying for our sins, that, of course, fulfills Scripture. What Psalm 22 speaks of, what Isaiah 53 speaks of, he would die for our sins. And, and of course, we think about the crucifixion, we think about that being the, uh, so foundational to the gospel message, and of course, also, we talk about the resurrection. Now, I'll talk about the resurrection in a couple of weeks when we get to Easter. But this crucifixion is foundational to the resurrection. He rose from the dead after he had been crucified. Now, Roman Catholic friends really emphasize the crucifixion of Jesus, and they keep Jesus on the cross, but we know that Jesus is no longer on the cross. He's alive, and of course, he's alive, and the grave is empty. The cross is empty now, but it is a rugged cross. It is a bloodstained cross that we remember because he went through all of that for you and for me. And we think about his crucifixion, we think about also the way he was treated. And just before they crucified him, they put this crown of thorns on him. Now, one of my trips to Israel, I bought, uh, bought a crown of thorns. I don't know how well you can see that. But let me just show you. This, this is a smaller version. This is five or six inches. A uh, larger version probably would have been more like nine inches or so. And, and I don't know how well you can see the, the thorns there. But some of these thorns are half inch. A couple of them are closer to a one inch. But this is, a, this is a smaller version of what the real thing would have looked like. You see, the real thing, there, there's a plant that's now been named the Christ Thorn Jujube tree. And those thorns grow out there in the wilderness of Judea. And I've seen it, and then hopefully I'll get a chance to post to our Gospel Center Church page and my own Facebook page later on a picture I've taken while I've been over there. The Christ Thorn Jujube tree could have thorns that are two inches and more in length. I mean, not just a half inch, not just an inch, but two inches and more in length. And so that is what's woven together from those branches woven together. And that's what they placed upon his head. And that's what they took the reed to beat down on his head to mock him as a king. I say that to say it would clearly bring blood. This, this crown would, would draw some blood if you press it upon, upon someone's brow. But all the more so that one would. That is to say Jesus, when he went through all this, suffered for you and me suffered for our sin he suffered in our place and as we look at the scripture and we look at this passage particularly we make much of the kingship of Jesus and we make much of the crucifixion of Jesus the king because of what he did for you and me I've shared this story with some of you before but in case you haven't heard it or if you need to be reminded of it on our two year anniversary my wife and I went to Italy and we did a tour of Italy and we went there with 41 other people from around the world and people from different faiths. We got a chance to witness to them at mealtime for over a 10-day trip, and we, we enjoyed that trip. One of the places we stopped, we were making our way from central to northern Italy, and every couple hours we'd stop to stretch our legs and sometimes grab a, a, a snack or something, and we had about an hour and a half at this one place, San Gimigano, and, and as we went there, uh, we toured a church. And we had seen already a lot of other older churches and maybe even more impressive than this one. So we didn't spend much time there. And as we were making our way out, we, we had about an hour left to kill. As we're walking the streets, we came across this place. It was a medieval torture museum. And we stopped to go in there to check it out. And they had nine different rooms dedicated with over 100 artifacts. And these artifacts were things like the knee splitter, things like the Iron Maiden, uh, Things like uh, the device that would hold your hands and they would place screws into your knuckles if you had been caught stealing or something. Knives that could sometimes cut off hands, which are still used in portions of the Middle East. Uh, ancient guillotines. And so much more. These were just a few of the descriptions. And yet out in the courtyard of this place, all these other rooms you go through and you see the device and you see the description of it, 
Took about 45 minutes to walk through, and Auntie gave up after a couple of rooms. Says, I'll, I'll be waiting for you in the lobby. And I made my way through, and I stepped out in that courtyard, and there stood a cross. And there was a description there. Instead of all the devices mankind has used to treat its people with great cruelty, none yet has ever been as, caused as much suffering and cruelty as the Roman cross. It's a Roman cross that one could hang on for literally days until their body could no longer push up to breathe. It's there where the birds could come and begin to peck away. It's there where they were humiliated as they were stripped naked. And it was through, it was through all that that Jesus suffered for me and for you. And so as we look ahead to the coming weeks and we think about Jesus' death for us, remember Jesus is the king. They mocked him in a way, but he was still the king. Who would have known that his cross would be a throne? And yet that's where he sat, suffering for you and me. As he went through this trial, has suffered leading up to the suffering he would take. As he was beaten and scourged, uh, 39 lashes, as Paul references the 40 minus 1, because this law says in Deuteronomy 25 that you could be beaten 40 times, and the Jews believed that they, they would do it 39 times to show, uh, the Romans believed they would do it to, to show some mercy. But this, this whip would have uh, bits of leather, and at the end of that leather would have bits of lead or other forms of metal or broken pottery or broken bone woven into that. So as it hit across the back, as a person was stretched out, it would begin to rip the, the, rip the flesh off the, off the body. I say that to say that's what Jesus went through for you and me. He suffered for you and me. So we take that, and you can either listen to that, you can dismiss that, you can be moved by that, or you can surrender your life to him because of that. You say, all that he did for me, he did this so that I wouldn't have to suffer and die, so that I wouldn't have to be separated from God. He did this for me. He suffered in my place. And you can turn from your sins. You can trust in Jesus. And you can take that message. You can share it with others. And say, hey, I don't want to see you suffer. Jesus suffered so that you wouldn't have to. Jesus is the king. So witness him who suffered for you. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. We thank you for what he went through for us. And Lord, our world's been turned upside down and we find ourselves in some strange days. But Lord, that doesn't diminish the fact of your great love and your great grace and your great mercy that's been extended to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice and through his suffering on our behalf. Lord, I pray that everyone watching would come to understand Jesus is truly the king and they would surrender their lives to him. So many of them have. I pray that others would. Lord, help us as we stand strong for you in these days. Help us as we spread this message, this message of hope, this message of our sins that can be forgiven, our fact that we can be at peace with you and have eternal life. Lord, for those that are watching, if they've not turned their lives to you, Lord, we pray they would ask questions or they would even begin to pray right now that ask that you would uh, save them from their sins, forgive them for their sins, and help them as they trust in Jesus, surrender their lives to Jesus as King. And so, Lord, help us as we live for you. Help us as we spread this word of hope. Thank you, Jesus, for suffering on our behalf. We offer all this up in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be in touch again real soon. Enjoy your day.